Welcome, everyone. Uh, why don't we just sit down and have a conversation? Yeah, let's do it. Chris, it's fantastic to have you. Uh, first, gauging the audience here, how many people have done robocar racing before? Okay, that's two. Two. How many people have flown a drone before? Ah. So, Chris, how, f first, help, help, me, uh, help me understand how, how a movement starts. You I, left Wired. I, I, I did, although, although I left Wired because, not. <laughs> um, so, so um, as you probably know, there's going to be a robocar race tomorrow afternoon. The teams are training you know, right now. And, and it's going like, to look like a toy. And you're probably going to say, how is this? How is this important? How is this relevant? You know, um, how is this not like you know a toy? And um, and I can wave my hands and give you all sorts of reasons. But the best thing I can do is tell you that 10 years ago they said the same thing when we did this about drones, <laughs> DIY drones. And they're like, you know, what are you doing? These things aren't drones. Drones are predators and global hawks, etc. And you've got sort of like you know, you know, foam airplanes with Arduinos in it. And we said um, we think there's a different way to innovate. This is the notion of, you know democratizing technology, making it easy, cheap, available to lots of people, on the grounds that maybe they'll come up with a different solution to the drone problem than Lockheed and Boeing. And today, all of you who put up your hands, that's, that's the movement we started. It was us and a company called DJI out of China in 2007, basically said drones aren't airplanes without pilots, they're smartphones with wings or propellers. And um, we were right, and we put millions of them out there, and that's kind of you know, the future of aerospace. Now, maybe that's going to happen with autonomous cars <laughs> as well, but you're, the, tomorrow night you'll find out. Wait, going, going back to 2007, what were those first couple years like? What were the pain points of building a, a movement of drones, taking something that honestly nobody was thinking about in their own context yeah. and making um, it accessible? Well, the interesting thing, in the first couple years, there were like no pain points. It was totally fun because basically the iPhone had just come out. And all of the components that make a drone, the, the MEMS sensors, accelerometers, gyros, the GPS, the camera, the wireless, the ARM core processors, all those were just suddenly, blah, they were there for, for the taking. Ten years earlier, these would have been box-sized mechanical gyros, impossible, no export controlled, you know, we wouldn't have had access to it. So the iPhone kind of made it easy. And, and, and when the iPhone came out, every, you know, everyone said, oh my God, iPhone, oh my God, apps. But, but a bunch of people in the hardware industry said, oh my God, there's something interesting about hardware again. These, you know, these components now being manufactured at kind of a Moore's Law pace we've never seen before, what else could they do? And some people did you know, 3D printing, and you know, our Glowforge friends, I'm sure, were doing this, and the wearables, the Fitbit team were doing this. And I was just like, let's stick it in a plane and, what, and see what happens. And the answer is it worked, it worked great. It was only about two years later that I realized that the pain was just beginning. Um, the reason it worked great on airplanes is because airplanes kind of want to fly. And you know, they were they kind of you know if, if your if your if your system crashes, they still kind of fly. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until we switched to copters, to quadcopters, etc. When your system crashes as a quadcopter, it's like tumbling down. And then we realized that we'd architected entirely wrong, and our assumptions about real time were not real time. And you know, Kalman filters and particle filters, and we had to go way down the rabbit hole, um, and that sucked. What to do all the collision detection so people. Collision detection was, I mean, that, 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 that sucked later. That was, that was the next pain point. But just, just understanding um, that, um, so, so um, with any kind of flying vehicle, and it's true for, for, to some extent for the cars as well, you basically have three functions. It's like walking down the street. Job number one is don't fall over, right? That's your inner ear. But that's understanding where down is. Uh -huh. So you and I probably think that where down is is really easy, but put yourself on a Disney ride when you're spun around and you don't know where down is. Well, that's what a drone's doing. They're on a Disney ride. So just knowing where down is was super hard. Um, the second thing is navigation. Just, you know, just you know, finding your way. Don't run into people, et cetera. And the third is knowing where you're going. Why am I going to the store, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, it took us about five years to get down, to get down, down. Mm. Right, five years to really have our control theory and our sensing in place using every sensor available so we could actually reliably know where down was. Um, then it, then you know, the collision detection and the navigation, et cetera, that was relatively easy. I don't want to say that the mapping part was easy, but it was easier than the down part. Hey, but talk to me about the we, though, because you started this with an open source community. Yeah. You started this also as a business. Um, there's a lot of other folks in this room that are, that are doing very similar things, where we're you know, day in, day out, investing in open source, but also running 
for-profit businesses. What was that like in the early days? Who were the main drivers to the movement of drones? Yeah. So I was, um, at the time, I was the editor of Wired magazine, and I'd had a back, I'd a scientific background, so I was a, I was a nerd, but um, I also have five kids, and I was trying to get them interested in technology, it, you know, cutting to the chase, utter failure. But, but that didn't stop me, you know, from trying, I thought maybe flying robots would be cool. Um, so the first thing we did is we made a flying robot out of uh, Lego Mindstorms parts on the dining room table, and, <laughs> and, it, and it worked. It's now in the Lego Museum in Billund, Denmark. No way. It, it, I mean, the, the, the airplane was made out of foam and stuff, but the, the autopilot was Lego Mindstorms. Huh. So that was awesome. Um, uh, well, I thought it was awesome. The kids, again, thought it was boring. Um, and so um, once that worked, I was like, what just happened? And I, uh, I did what one does, which is create a website. And because it was 2007, not 2001, I didn't create a blog, I created a social network. Mm -hmm. And that called DIY Drones. And that social network became a place where everyone else who was thinking about the same thing, and a lot of people were thinking about the same thing, just they had a place to go. And like literally my co-founder at 3D Robotics, um, he was sitting at home flying a radio control helicopter with a Wii controller. And he thought, oh my god, this is freaking amazing. I can fly a helicopter with a Wii controller. And he went and Googled, it's like, is anyone doing you know, this kind of stuff? Um, he, he Googled on a Friday, and there was nothing. And it turned out that like, Saturday morning I set up the site. Then he Googled again on Saturday, and there the site was. And he joined it, and he became one of the, one of the leaders. And then we started a company together. And you know, four years later, before I'd even met him, we were making more drones than all of America's aerospace companies combined. Wow. And it turns out he was a teenager from Tijuana, Mexico, who, you know, who I met on the internet. That is amazing. Wait, 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 but what, what, who was buying those drones? I mean, how much of this was Hackers were hobbyists? hobbyists? How much of this were, when, when did the industry start coming together? It was, um, so the years from 2007 to about 2011 were all hackers and hobbyists. Um, they were basically, you know, us, 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 us folks. They were doing it because they liked tinkering, they liked learning. Um, then um, DJI, which is based in Shenzhen, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it was actually focused on the really high-end um, cinematic use of drones, and which are you know, eight propellers and extremely expensive. And they thought, we need a trainer for the high-end you know, operators so they're not like, not like learning on expensive equipment. So they made this really simple um, uh, you know, plastic drone called the Phantom. Yep. And it turns out that people didn't want a trainer for high-end drone. What they wanted was the really simple easy to use drone. So the Phantom then completely changed it. It went, but then Wait, it went. Seriously, it was, a, they, they built that just to train pilots. That was the vision. Wow. Huh. All right. And then, um, and then, and then it went from like, you know, open source and, and DIY and hackers to Walmart and yeah. people who just wanted a camera that could fly. So that was, that was the big transition in that. And, and, and that part, it's a very different skill set going from kind of, you know, development tools, which is what we do, what we do here, to just a, a box with a button that, <laughs> that works. So, so the, the early years were all driven by demand of, of folks like us, is what you're saying. When, did, how many years into this did industry start coming in? When did it, when? You mean the commercial when, side? Yeah, when is there, when it, when does the tipping point happen? I'm yeah. really interested to understand that. I want to talk about this from the, the drone side first to understand what, what some of the parallels are, because we're in the very early sure. days. Yeah, so the parallels are actually, um, there's a technology trend, just the different adoption groups, then mm -hmm. there's a regulatory side. And actually, um, so, so in the case of the technology side, you know, first it was like the tools were available so you could do it yourself. Then the device was available so you could just get, get the imagery, and later on the commercial side became, the ROIs became obvious. Mm -hmm. um, th that, 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 um, that trajectory was highly influenced by the regulations. It turns out that these things, the cars and the drones, are designed to navigate the gray space of regulation. Mm -hmm. So with drones, commercial use was banned. You needed to have a special permission, but recreational use was allowed. So my children could fly drones, but trained professionals could not. Don't even ask. Um, the other thing was that, um, like, like um, Drones that were, came from like traditional military industrial complex were export controlled. But there was an exemption for public domain. Open source, public domain. Hmm. Um, FCC, it requires you go through a full you know, certification of things, but there's an exemption for developer things. If you're selling to a developer rather than end user, you don't have to go through FCC. And we just went right down the list and we found these loopholes, totally legal, 
but things that the regulators had never anticipated. Regulators had never imagined that children would be flying drones. When they wrote those rules in the 80s, they assumed it was like there was about six aerospace companies, they had armies of lawyers, they were selling to the military, and it was yeah. easy to control. It's like the internet, you know, um, versus the telcos. Fascinating. All right, now let's, let's transition to today, or better said, when did you start RoboCar Racing? Uh, how many years ago? What was, and, and, and where, where are we in a, in a similar life cycle yeah. of adoption and playing? Well, it's, it's moving faster. So, so with drones, what we did is we took an, an existing industry, the aerospace industry, that always had, already had drones, and we sort of reimagined it as kind of a bottoms-up you know, DIY. We put the letters DIY in front of an existing industry. And we're doing exactly the same with cars. There's already cars out there. There's an existing industry. There's already autonomous cars. We put the letters DIY in, in front to try to achieve the same sort of different innovation path. Um, I started this about a year ago, a year and a half ago. Mm. And um, we have a um, community of about 10,000 people around the world, um, about uh, 40 different country national groups. We meet every, uh, every month in a big warehouse in Oakland and, and race. Um, uh, uh, Will Roscoe and Adam Conway, who are um, you know, leading the donkey car team, were, were, were part of it initially. And um, you, you know, the reason I, did, I switched to cars was that, two reasons. First of all, as a company, we were no longer in the hardware business. We were just doing the software. So mm -hmm. my hardware itch needed scratching. And second of all, drones are kind of solved. Mm -hmm. You know, all the really hard stuff, and it was really hard, is solved. Whereas cars are harder. And you may ask, why are cars harder? They're a 2D problem rather than a 3D problem. And the answer is that with drones, we get away with murder on the mapping navigation side. We have GPS, and it's like a meter, two meter, who cares? It's like 400 feet in the yeah. sky, good enough. Um, the, the, uh, and the cars, you can't count on GPS, so you need to use computer vision and, you know, and sensing and things like that. And also, the, you, you can't deviate by three meters on the, on the road. So we needed to kind of come at the problem with an AI kind of machine learning approach, mm -hmm. which is, whereas with the drones, it was pure control theory. And you know, control theory. I mean, you can. We can, I'm sure have endless debates about whether control theory is harder or easier than AI. But I found control theory to be easier than AI. Also, the tools for control theory, like common filters, etc., were already out there 10 years ago. Where the tools for machine learning and AI, like TensorFlow, etc., have only really come out in the past couple of years. We've had cloud training and all that. Walk me through what we have here. So this is this, by the way, is is not what you have down there. The donkey cars down there are pure are, are using cameras. Mm -hmm. and uh, convolutional neural networks that are trained. Uh, so basically what they do is they, they um, it's called um, behavioral cloning. So what you do is you drive manually around the track a few times, it gathers images, it then correlates them to your inputs, sends it up to the cloud, and then trains the network. And then you get what's called an inference um, model, which is basically, okay, this is a kind of a pre-trained net, and then that net runs on a Raspberry Pi on the car, and rather than you driving, it kind of drives for you. So that's behavioral cloning. It clones your behavior. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's computer vision. This one here is using solid state LIDAR. And this is just to show you a little bit of the range. So solid state LIDAR was like a really hard thing. This is now $600 um, solid state LIDAR out of China. All this amazing LIDAR is coming out of China. This one has, you know, it's, you wouldn't drive a car. It's 20 meter range, 130 degree by seven degree, you know, range. But it's like 600 bucks and it's going to be 300 bucks in a year's time. And so this will be the structure. Wait, wait, where did you get this? It's called a Benwaki CE30. And I got it from, from Taobao. You're, you're getting China, on Alibaba and China buying is, solid state LiDAR. China is crushing us on low end LiDAR. And the reason being is that, that um, a lot of it is for warehouse robots. So you know about like Kiva systems and Amazon. China's just got like 10 times as many warehouse robots. They're automating everything. Uh, uh, it's surprising, China's actually on the verge of a labor shortage, not surplus, because of the one-child policy, et cetera. Mm. And because there's this boom in e-commerce, they're just automating everything. Factories, warehouses, et cetera. And these things are all being used for warehouse robots. Wait, hey, how many people in here have bought stuff on Alibaba? Yeah. Or Taobao. Yeah. <laughs> or Taobao, yeah. No. Uh, yeah. So, so basically, we decided that, you know, in the same way that the iPhone you know, components were the enabler for DIY drones. This kind of extraordinary Moore's law in, in both, you know, sensing, like LiDAR, um, and it includes radar and sonar and things like that, um, and uh, in, in time of flight, you know, uh, 1D sensors, and the cloud compute and neural network tools that we get from, you know, from, from all of our friends here. Those are the enablers for this. And the reason we do it small is that, first of all, DIY implies a couple things. It implies cheap, 
So everything has to be $200. This one's a little bit more than $200, but everything should be around $200. Um, easy, which is follow the instructions and it'll work. Um, fun, decide for yourself tomorrow afternoon, but I, I think you'll find that it's fun. And then it has to be safe. And, and, and that's safe by some definition. It's definitely not safe for the cars. They're gonna, pieces of plastic everywhere. But there's no human on board. Um, you're doing it indoors. There's no regulations. Um, nobody's gonna get hurt. Um, maybe your wall a little bit. Um, and so, um, and so this, this, you know, the Chinese, as the new enabler of these kind of DIY tools right now, whether it's embedded processing or neural compute engines or, or, or LIDARs, et cetera, this is, this is why we can do this. And by the way, you know, what you'll see between, between the, the donkey cars and this is you basically see everything that's in a Waymo mm -hmm. or an Uber or a Tesla, but like not as good. So every sensor they've got, every, every you know, all compute they've got, it's sort of like, you know, we've, we've got them all. But you know, this one's got like you know, one, I don't know, one one hundredth the resolution of a Waymo mm -hmm. LiDAR. Maybe it's one fiftieth, but something like that. So you know, don't get in it. <laughs> don't ride on the street. But if you want to learn how to do that, and you can't afford an autonomous car, get an autonomous car, you know, get permission to drive an autonomous car, or put your life at risk, this is how to participate in the autonomous car revolution um, for everybody. Well, uh, walk me through what the race looks like tomorrow. You, you've talked about this training component. Right. So it starts in the, what, in the morning you're going to start? Oh, actually, start you building? know, I'm not exactly sure what the particular, the way we normally do it is that um, we start, uh, so you train in the morning. Okay. This means this behavioral, everyone sort of drives around, builds their models, sends them up to the cloud, trains. Then you um, start with time trials. And so you go around, you try to get the best time. Then, try to, then you have a ladder, et cetera. And then they go um, uh, head to head or wheel to wheel in this case, two cars. Um, you know, you know kind of the best of each ladder goes head to head. And there you have not only the problem of beating another car, but also the interference of another car, you know, running into you and all that kind of stuff. And at the end, we stick all the cars on the track, and it's just like, it's just like robo demolition derby. It's total, <laughs> total chaos, and it's just for fun. Uh, the cars tomorrow are using cameras. Right. They're well, connected actu to actually, I think, um, Antonio was telling me they were going to also add some GPS cars, just to see what happens. Help me understand uh, what are the strengths of front-facing cameras, what are the strengths of GPS, high-precision GPS, yeah. and first LiDAR, and what does this also mean? Like, how do you lay a track? How do you, I mean? Well, the, the track's the easy part, tape, <laughs> paint. <laughs> you know, um, so any kind of, any, anything will do, white lines, red lines, yellow lines. We start gaffer's tape, doesn't leave a mark. Um, the, uh, we basically have two, two, two sets of teams. One of them uses um, deep learning. Um, so they, it's, it, it basically they get the whole image and they just let the neural networks figure it out. And the other uses more conventional computer vision techniques where they do line detection and edge detection and blob detection and try to, and try to you know, actually sort of recognize what they're seeing and then steer based on that. Um, right now they're neck and neck. Um, mm. And they're both within 5% of the best humans out there. Um, so these, so the, 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 the robots can drive these cars within 5% of the best human manual drivers, which is pretty good, and they'll soon be better. Um, then, um, so then, then the question is, you know, what, so you have these two schools. One of them is kind of Tesla-like, that's the pure kind of computer vision, and the other one is more sort of Waymo-like, which brings in more deep learning and, 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 and other sensors. Um, I, I'm of the school of thought that you need every sensor available. You need it all, right? Because, I mean, people say, well... Cameras are enough, you know, we only have eyes and we're pretty good at driving. Well, two things. First of all, we're not pretty good at driving. Right. 40,000 people per year. And second of all, let's say you decide, like Tesla did, for example, to only use cameras. Mm -hmm. And let's say you kill people. Is that okay? If you could have also used LiDAR, if you could have also used, you know, with bristling other sensors, but you didn't, is it okay to kill people because you had a philosophy? And I think the answer is probably Waymo would decide the answer is no. Mm -hmm. You should use every sensor available to yourself so you have these multi, and you know from the mapping perspective, when you combine dimensions, orthogonal dimensions, you get a better solution. Yep. And I think that ultimately we're gonna have to combine everything, inertial, LIDAR, radar, sonar, time of flight, cameras everywhere, hmm. maps, yeah, all I mean, together. Yeah, I mean, these, um, these run in parallel to a lot of the conversations We've been having with Mobileye, who has, I mean, right? They're using their own front-facing cameras, their own their own sensors, uh, but the map is a critical component. Yeah. In addition to, like, how do you, how do you see beyond the horizon? Absolutely. Hey, uh, how do you how do you, where do you process this data? Do I mean, 
people have to be running their own their yeah. own instances up in Amazon, or how, how yeah. does this work? Yeah, so so um, so these actually this one here, which doesn't use deep learning, is all running locally on the Raspberry Pi. So we, we're doing a SLAM algorithm. It's called Breezy SLAM. It's okay. kind of optimized for embedded uh, devices. The the one the donkey cars are um, there's a there's a TensorFlow um, you know cluster, um, and you just you know you it, you follow the instructions and you just create an instance on AWS and there you go. Uh, we started talking about this, I want to say like two months ago, when we were in Colorado with the Founder Group folks who were over dinner. And but what blew my mind about what you've started here is you've changed the surface area hmm. for developers to engage with a problem that, honestly, only some of the most well-funded large auto companies in the world are working on Absolutely. right now. Uh, who are these people that are, that are building that's, these that's cars? A, and how do, you, how do you see this starting to to change the space? That's a, it's a great question. Well, first of all, the people are completely unbounded. So we have retirees, we have students, we have people from around the world, we have people who don't know anything about technology and people who, who by day work for Google. Mm -hmm. um, right now, if you want to be in the autonomous car industry, there's really only three ways to do it. You can work for an autonomous car company, you can work for a company adjacent to autonomous cars, like, like, like Mapbox, or you can take a class, like Udacity or Coursera's self-driving mm -hmm. car class, and do it all in simulation. Um, the first two, I'll leave that to your career to get. The classes are amazing, and I would really recommend you, you take one of those classes. The problem is, is that everything works in simulation. Everything works. I mean, you can, you know, if you write your code wrong, it won't work, but basically, once you write your code right, everything works in simulation. Um, and nothing works in the real world. <laughs> you take, you, you could get a straight A in the Udacity self-driving car, car course and, and plenty of those students to come to our, 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 our races, and they can't even get around the track because Lighting, shadows, noise. Oh, I didn't realize this camera was going to be so low resolution. I didn't realize it was going to be so close to the ground. I didn't realize there was going to be this other car there. Oh, that corner right there is way too sharp. You know, the real world, right? So um, the surface area that we expose, to use your phrase, is the real world. There's, it's really difficult to do autonomous cars in the real world without, spending, without passing one of those career filters of working for those companies who are spending a lot of money. And this is a way to actually test Test your, uh, your skills in the real world. Going back to the beginning of our conversation, how a developer-focused community became a developer-focused business. Right now, everything you're doing here, this is, um, this is actually not your day job. It's not my day job. <laughs> although, although, I try very hard every now and then to find a way to have it aligned with my day job just so I can justify the hours. Hey, where, do you, where do you see this going? Is this, I mean, is, are, is there going to be money here? Is it going to be funded by a bunch of hobbyists very similar to the early drone days? Like, how is this going to play out? So I'm trying really hard not to answer that question because I used to have a hobby, which was like flying robots, and then it became a job, and then it wasn't a hobby anymore, and it wasn't fun. It was my job. Uh, this is still fun, and this is still my hobby, and if I industrialized yet another hobby, it's like <laughs> I'm going to have to like take a painting or something. Um, so I'm, I'm trying not hard not to tell you about how all the various things you can, you can do, companies you could start out of this. However... It does occur to me that, you know, so one of the obvious questions is like, what are you doing here with these toys? You're not as good as the Teslas and the Ubers and the Googles. And the, that's right, we're not, but we're different. And in the same way that our initial drones were not as good as the General Atomics drones, but then they got better faster, the question is whether this path of innovation of democratized DIY crazy race wheel-to-wheel -wheel stuff might lead to better cars, mm -hmm. autonomous cars in the future, because we can just, we're, we're taking a different, we're, we're the mammals to their reptiles or whatever. I don't know, we'll find a non pejorative uh, evolutionary uh, metaphor. Um, so, as you know, you know, typically the car industry has all, has all sort of developed best engines and suspension through racing, Formula One, yep. et cetera. You know, car industry and racing went hand to hand. But with autonomous cars, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. We're not racing autonomous cars because no one wants to die, crash, lose a lot of money, get embarrassed, headlines, etc. And the question is, how could we bring racing into autonomous cars to, dis to discover new, more nimble, aggressive algorithms in a way that doesn't imperil lives and, and, and dollars? And it might be, the big thing we do is racing, wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing. And um, it's possible we will find a, a way to be safer by being more aggressive. And if you ask the Mobileye guys, I just saw a great presentation from the CEO at, uh, at the Intel Capital event. Mm -hmm. they, um, they practice, they, they, they train their stuff on the streets of Jerusalem. 
And they do it, it's all about aggressive driving, aggressive merging. You know, it's not like there's a, a space for your car. And, and they show this funny video where the Waymo cars wait for a space, and there's like no space. And they come onto the entrance ramp, and they wait for a space, and there is no space, and they go off the exit ramp. They gave, gave up. Rather than being rude, they gave up. Whereas in Jerusalem, it's like, that's not going to get you where you want to go. <laughs> so the, the Mobileye team are, 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 are teaching the cars to kind of nudge their way in and be sort of like, you know, push their body, push the body of the car halfway over the line and, you know, accelerate brilliantly into that little thing that's super aggressive. And so my question is, you know, my, my thought is, if this is of any good at all, aside from just training a bunch of people and, you know, discovering new sensors and things like that, if it's, if it's any good, it's for doing aggressive, scary, risky things uh -huh. that the big cars won't do. Amazing. Uh, so tomorrow, racing starts sometime in the afternoon. I think 4.20. Uh, can, we, can we throw the uh, Snapchat? Uh, how many people here are using Snapchat? Excellent. Grab, gra grab a picture of this. Uh, this is going to put the uh, autonomous uh, filter uh, to all your, all your pictures, which you'll need, uh, which you'll need tomorrow. Uh, there are a few slots left open. What kind of folks would you encourage? Because, uh, again, you only saw literally, I want to say 80% of the hands raised, 80% uh, of the folks here raised their hands for flying drones. Two people yeah. raised their hands for and, doing donkey cars. And one of them was an organizer. <laughs> um, so I don't know. And, and, and Tony, how many slots are open? Come on up, Antonio. Grab that. Hey, uh, so we are running a race tomorrow, as Chris and Eddie were saying, 420. But the fun part is that before the race, we're going to teach you how these things work. And uh, we're going to have 25 of those. We are going to go through every individual component. We are going to teach you how to drive them, how to teach them how to drive. And you get to keep them. Uh, at the end of the day, those donkey cars that we are going to be uh, working with, you keep them. You, you stay with them, and you keep driving them during the meetups that Chris organizes every month. Uh, we have about half a dozen spots still available. So if you want to join this workshop that starts at the beginning of the day, so we're going to be basically working with this throughout the day to have them ready for the race, just look for me after this session or just go to the registration desk downstairs and sign up for the workshop. Uh, we have the workshop during the day, the race at the end of the day. And how hard is it? What skills would you recommend that people have? You should be an expert on machine learning, computer vision, <laughs> hardware, and artificial <laughs> intelligence if you want to apply for this. You don't need any of that. So the cars are already pre-assembled, and the basics are already there. So if you are not super familiar with hardware, that's OK and you have basically everything ready for you to start working. And we're going to be working you through the process of training it. You don't need to code. You don't need to um, get into the details of how this works. We're going to be working you through the different uh, steps to make this work. And then if you want, you can have the opportunity to dip deeper on any of these components. And you can ask hardware-related questions, software-related questions. So anyone can totally follow the, the workshop, uh, no special uh, training required. And, and can you say one more thing? Can you say what the map, what the localization component is? Yeah, so that's a, a special challenge that we uh, gave some teams to be part of. Uh, what we want to do in the workshop is to follow the standard process, right? Uh, what Chris was describing before, we are going to be using the camera on the Raspberry Pi. We want to be training the models. And we are going to be basically following the tracks. Uh, for some teams, we share what we call the donkey car SDK uh, from Mapbox. Uh, we have encoded the GPS coordinates of the tracks downstairs uh, so that they can use GPS to follow those tracks and see how fast they are following GPS coordinates versus uh, pure um, camera-driven uh, uh, training. Antonio, congratulations on the donkey car SDK. Chris, congratulations on birthing another crazy do-it-yourself movement with Robocar Racing. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks for Fantastic. having me. Fantastic.